One of the most important principles of the Bible is rarely mentioned today and in fact seems to have been widely abandoned. Yet this principle is key to your personal salvation. And unless you understand it and are willing to practice it, the Bible says you have no hope for everlasting life. What exactly is it and how does it work? Stay tuned for a word from your Bible. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age. Much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? A recent survey found that half of all who claim to have been converted and saved go back on their conversion within a year. Clearly, something is terribly wrong. In some cases, the professed change was obviously insincere. In others, the profession was only half-hearted. But in most all of these failures exists a misunderstanding about what is involved in the course of action leading to salvation. Before we get to the crux of the matter, we need to understand that the Bible teaches that salvation is not something immediately guaranteed in a believer's life. The Apostle Paul, whose actual name was Shaul, talked about having a hope of salvation in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8-9. He explained that being saved is a process in 2 Corinthians 2.15. In 1 Corinthians 3.15, he described salvation and being saved as a state we do not already possess and have not already achieved. In fact, he wasn't even sure about his own future, but simply had the hope that he might attain the resurrection. He said in Philippians 3, 11 and 12, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. Now if this man who wrote much of the New Testament was not even certain of his own salvation, how can anyone today say they are already saved? Yet you hear people being asked by well-meaning evangelists, are you saved? As if it is a foregone conclusion and a guarantee, and they are now free to live any kind of life they please and still be assured an eternal reward. In Hebrews 6, however, we read that there are those people who were enlightened and actually tasted of the prospect of salvation and were even given the Holy Spirit. These were definitely on the road to salvation. Yet, they are warned that should they fall away from the truth that there is no longer any hope for them. Their salvation would be permanently lost. Let's read verse 6 of Hebrews 6. It says, it is impossible, quote, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they impale to themselves the son of Elohim afresh, and put him to an open shame. Two facts to note here. Falling away means a complete and utter rejection of the truth and the Savior who died for us. People ask, well, what if I committed some bad sins? Am I forever lost? Not if you confess your sins and repent. And that is the second point of this passage and the subject of today's program. To renew your right standing with your Heavenly Father, you must repent of your sins. You don't hear much about repentance these days, yet the act of repentance is essential to being converted as a child of the Most High. Many have missed this key part of conversion in the New Testament. Without this knowledge of repentance and changing of your life, you cannot understand what it means to be saved. Before we can repent, we need to know what sin is. Now everyone knows what a crime is. A crime is on par with a sin. 
Webster defines a crime as an act that violates a law. The same is true for sin. In the clearest and most precise definition in the Bible, 1 John 3, 4, it says that sin is a violation of biblical law. Let's read this most elemental and pivotal passage defining sin. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. How crystal clear. That's simple and easy enough to grasp. If sin is breaking of law, then not breaking of law means obedience to the law. We can break a law in ignorance because we did not know about it, but that doesn't mean that sin is not imputed to us simply because we are unaware of it. We are still guilty. The same as what happens when we race down a highway, not knowing what the speed limit is, and still be charged with a traffic violation. Ignorance is no excuse. We are all breakers of biblical law, and therefore we are sinners whether we know it or not. The Bible includes the Ten Commandments. Lying, stealing, killing, these are all acts of sin by biblical definition. The Bible also gives other laws that Yahweh commands to be observed, and violation of any one of them is also sin. By the same definition of sin. Sin leads to eternal death. If we are guilty as charged of a lifetime of unrepentant and willful sin, our hope of salvation will be dashed. The scriptures tell us that unless we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, we are spiritually lost. There is no hope beyond this earthly life unless we change and conform to the scriptural way of life. James 4.4 tells us that the ways of the world make one the enemy of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, and those ways lead to death. On the other hand, Proverbs 12.28 reveals, In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Righteousness means life. Sin equates to death. And that is where repentance is pivotal. Repentance means that we move away from sin and toward righteousness. Almighty Yahweh will not allow an unrepentant sinner to sit on a throne in his coming kingdom. The Messiah Yahshua instructed his followers in Matthew 18.3 when he said, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Conversion means change, and it begins with repentance. But well, we have much more eye-opening information on the subject of salvation and repentance, so stay tuned after this brief message. We'll be right back. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, and I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, Yahweh is my Elohim. Who has ascended into heaven, or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. In Luke 
13, we read that there were some murdered Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. In verse 3, our Savior said, Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. The two principles, conversion and repentance, must take place or else salvation will be lost. So, what exactly does it mean to repent? One Greek word translated repent in the New Testament is metanoio. It is a verb that means to come to the realization that one is a sinner. But it goes even beyond just a simple realization. It is far more essential than simple recognition. It means to change one's very perception or view of sin, to understand that sin is death. Sin that is practiced in one's life results in nothing less than ultimate spiritual death. Now, a related word for repent in the New Testament is the Greek noun metanoia. This word signifies a real change in one's entire attitude towards sin itself, which affects the whole life. It means a change in how we live. It amounts to a complete turnaround in the way we act, and the way we live. It means not just to be sorry for sin, but to make a 180 degree reverse course in how we live. It means to renounce sin and its destructive ways and never to practice it again. Too often, however, we see a more common erroneous understanding of repentance signified by the Greek metodolomai. This simply means that I regret what I did because I got caught. It is the kind of regret children often have when their parents punish them for doing something wrong. In the Bible, it is also that kind of regret which Judas Iscariot felt for betraying the Savior Yahshua. But this is a false repentance that lacks the power and force to affect permanent change in one's life. It's shallow and it's easily reversed. As soon as the punishment stops, the person is back to his sin again. A biblical example of genuine repentance is the person who admits his sin, seeks forgiveness, and then makes a complete turnaround, permanently stopping what he or she had been doing, never to repeat it. True repentance leads to true conversion. Nothing less than that, the scriptures say, will do. Just to say, I'm sorry, is not enough. Just apologizing from your sin, but failing to turn from sinful behavior is not repentance. A change must take place in the very heart of the individual. Ezekiel 18.21 gives us the proper perspective on repentance. Here, the prophet writes, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says Yahweh Elohim, and not that he should return from his ways and live? In the New Testament, which is a doctrinal, really a repeat of the Old Testament in many ways, a mirror, you might say, image of the Old Testament, we read from Acts 17.30, quote, And the times of this ignorance Elohim winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. There is not a man or woman alive who is sinless. Everyone on earth has sinned in one way or another. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of Elohim. Well, that means, obviously, that everyone is in need of repentance if they have any hope for life everlasting. The sincerely and truly repentant individual loathes his sin and resolves never to repeat it. The parable of the prodigal son is an object lesson in what must take place in a sinner's life when he repents. 
Our Savior Yahshua told us this parable, and it's about a, a son who squandered his inheritance through riotous living and transgressions. And after suffering miserably for it, he's even reduced to feeding slop to pigs and losing all he had. Well, he finally comes to the realization that such a life is a dead end, and he comes to his senses and asks that he can return to his father. His first step is then realization. He has to admit he has done wrong. No one else can do it for him. No one else can repent for you. Oftentimes we are brought low through the pain of trials and tribulations and problems that we face in this life for this exact purpose. It is many times the only thing that will bring us back to our senses about the self-destructive, sinful behavior we are in. And our Heavenly Father uses this to change or to get us to realize that we need a change in our lives. It's not always pleasant, but tribulation, as we are all aware, gets us to stand up and take notice and reassess what we are living and how we are living in this life. Well, after we realize this, we have a decision to make. If we want to improve our standing before our Father in heaven, an honest desire to change is mandated. And after that, then, comes a deep and total remorse. And in the scriptures we read, And the Son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no more worthy to be called your Son. This is the parable that our Savior gave in Luke 15, 21. This prodigal, this wayward boy, had to get to the point where he would sacrifice all his self-centered goals, his wants, his desires, and his ambitions, and humbly ask for forgiveness both from Yahweh, his heavenly Father, and from his father and his family. Finally, and this is the key to repentance, comes a complete and permanent change in our behavior. This is the most important step we must take. In repentance, we have to have a change. But first, the first two steps are necessary in order to reach the third. It's a process necessary for anyone who wants to achieve true repentance. Well, stay tuned, and in a moment, we'll be back with more. If you find this program informative, then our website is for you. YRM.org is packed with eye-opening information, more than we could ever put into a 30-minute program. Online, you will find dozens of studies, sermon and music downloads, and an order form for our newsletter, Bible course, free CD and DVD sermons, and dozens of free study booklets on a wide variety of topics all just a click away. And don't forget to join us online each Saturday at 1.30 Central Time for our live worship service. 
Type YRM.org in your internet browser and start discovering the truth today. If you're interested in more Bible truth, we offer an abundance of free literature here. And, and one of our more well-received booklets is Your Salvation is Not Assured Until the End. It details basically the same information we're covering here in the program. And we think you'll find it fascinating. All you have to do is write for it and we'll send it to you. Or you can download it off our website. We talk here about how, as we did today, about how Paul said even his own uh, salvation was not assured. And he says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 13, 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. He says, prove your own selves. It's not something that just comes automatically. He says, we are made partakers of Messiah if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. Well, the booklet again is, your salvation is not assured until the end. And you can write for it, it's free of charge. The parable that we just uh, went over is really a lesson in how our Heavenly Father will indeed forgive anyone who sincerely and with a true heart repents and turns to Him. His forgiveness of our transgressions is shown in how the prodigal's father reacted to his son's sincerity. We read, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it. And let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Luke 15, verse 22 to 24. Well, we know that sin leads to death. Sin kills. The only way to get out of a life of sin and to begin to overcome it is through repentance. One of the most poignant stories of repentance is King David's heart-rending confession in Psalm 51, a masterpiece of repentance and a tribute to the person the Bible calls a man after Yahweh's own heart. David's genuineness is clear from the very beginning when approached about his sin by Nathan the prophet, David immediately confessed his adulterous transgression. He did not shift blame to Bathsheba, saying something like, Yes, but she tempted me. She should not have done that. He did not offer personal excuses. Oh, it was just one of those weaker moments of mine. All he did simply and straightforwardly confessed openly and honestly when he said, I have sinned. And this is one reason David is a man who has a heart like the father, the Bible says. Sure, he made a, a huge mistake in his life, no denying that, and so do we sometimes. But just as surely, he showed a complete and sincere repentance, and so must we. You know, the Bible is an amazing book. It details the dirt, the blemishes, the evil in the heart of natural man. It shows us the good, the bad, and the ugly about life. It is completely honest with us. There's no other book like it that's so candid and so forthright. And because life is an unending string of evil as well as good, we must be aware and ready for any pitfalls that could snare us. The Bible also shows how to overcome life's dangers. The prophet Ezekiel provides a way to avoid certain death that can result from sin. He says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. 
He goes on to say, All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says Yahweh Elohim. And not that he should return from his ways and live. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21 to 23. Now, our Heavenly Father does not wish that any of us should perish. And he seeks true repentance. He seeks the, the heart and the willingness of a person to completely change and come to a better knowledge of him. And that's what repentance really is. It's followed by a permanent change in behavior. It's the kind of change others will quickly notice. The sincere individual will put his Father in heaven before everything else in this life. You know, the scriptures are clear that you can't have it both ways. You can't live for yourself and for Almighty Yahweh at the same time. It just doesn't work. You cannot pursue mammon and the Father at the same time. One is opposed to the other. One is in disharmony with the other. They clash. The Apostle Paul shows clearly that a changed heart is like David's heart, one that desires to please the Father in heaven in all things. We read in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. Repentance is a necessary preliminary to baptism. Remember in Acts chapter 2, the famous scene where Peter is standing there on the day of Pentecost, and he commands those gathered in Acts 2 to, quote, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, for the remission of sin. He commands this. He, he wants us to first be baptized after we have repented of our sins. Sins must be obliterated, at least the past sins that we have committed in our life before we can be immersed. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, he says. And insincere repentance leads to a false and worthless baptism. Now we can see the importance of repentance in getting us right before our Heavenly Father. Only a sincere desire for forgiveness coupled with a change in heart, mind, and action will be acceptable to the one who grants salvation to those he chooses. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time for another Discover the Truth.